against Andrew Tenjam, number three and number 12 respectively on our 2016 Player of the Year race here on the SCG Tour. For Tenjum, he's going to the Player Championship. For Stevens, the Texas, Nate, the Texas native, excuse me, he's trying to go there as well. So he's going to start things off with an ancient stirrings off of a Yavamaya coast. One of the things I always like about Todd, outside of how well-dressed he is, is he's always trying to brew. Mm -hmm. You know, he did play some kind of stock-ish decks when he was destroying people with Naya Company, uh, but this is kind of his own innovation here. This is really out of nowhere, as it looks like he might be taking a brush land here with his ancient stirrings, and he will. So this is this is basically all the platinum hits on the Eldrazi curve. You have Mana Reshaper, Thought Knots here, Reality Smasher, all great deals for the mana cost. Uh, and Eldrazi Temple is still legal too. Yeah. So you get some shades of the old busted draws. A swamp of Isra here from Tenjim, and we're gonna go back over to Stevens. Stevens will draw a copy of Reality Smasher. And we will see another copy of Ancient Stirring. So down to 18 he'll go. Reality Smasher in there as an option. Same with World Breaker, and it looks like Thought Knots here will be the weapon of choice. Now, the interesting thing about the Eldrazi decks is how extreme do you want to go in trying to find the Eldrazi Temple? We've seen green red versions that play a card like Sylvan Scrying, Oath of Nissa, all of that stuff to be able to enable this. It doesn't look like Todd is going that approach, but he does have some mana accelerants in his deck in Noble Hierarch. So, some interesting things that he can do as here comes Viscerous here into the red zone. Path of Exile is going to go after that. Very interesting threat to path here. Um, uh, to me, this speaks of two things. One, concession to mana. Stevens is likely to be tapping out for his re, you know, his reality smasher, thought not see or matter reshaper type threats over the next couple turns. Uh, and it's also possible that Stevens is just very worried about the combo. It's not like his deck interacts that well against it. So opportunities to break up the pieces, I think uh, he's going to take his shots. I always do a viscerous here check as well to see how many people are actually playing. Yep. Some people kind of skimp. A little bit, because it's not really that great of a card. It's part of the combo. Scrying is nice with Kitchen Finks and Murderous Red Cap and all that jazz. Uh, but you'll find that Tenjim actually does have three copies of that card in his deck, as there he plays a Malaria Sylvac Outcast. And now we're going to go Steven's way. He'll play an Eldrazi Displacer. Kavner Souls predictably naming Eldrazi as we head back over to Tenjim. One of the also interesting things about Obzon Company is what bullets you want to play. You can play as many one ofs as you want, it's just which ones do you actually want to play. And the bullets here in Tenjim's main deck, one copy of Scavenging Ooze, one copy of Fiend Hunter, and one copy of Murderous Red Cap, which is part of some of the combo kills. You know, sometimes you see a card like, depending on what the format looks like, Orzhov Pontiff. Uh, you mentioned the Fiend Hunter, that's hanging out in there. Sometimes you see people go all the way to the top rope with a card like Revelark. Mm -hmm. So it just really depends on what the metagame looks like. Reminds you a lot of Birthing Pod back when that card was legal. So here's a Kitchen Finks. What's the follow-up going to be? It's a Bird of Paradise. So Stevens will untap. Stevens will draw. Picked up a matter reshaper. Doesn't have Eldrazi Temple just yet, but deck is working just fine. You see colorless mana for the Eldrazi. Not a problem at all here for Todd. Yep. Yavamaya Coast, Brushland, Adakar Waste if you want. I don't know if it's in his, his deck or not. Take a look. Don't see Adakar Waste. I do see a Thought Knots here. Collected Company, Court of Calling. And an Overgrown Tomb are the options here for Stevens. I feel like he almost has to select Court of Calling. I do not believe his deck can beat Infinite Life. And Tenjim is threatening it. So he has to get that out of there. Even though leaving Tenjim with Collective Company is also bad news. Tenjim, after losing that Court of Calling, is going to play a main phase copy of Collective Company. Viscerous here is in that pile, so he has found his infinite life combo, and he's actually found some protection, I think, in Spellskite if he wants that. Tends to doing it on the main phase because the shields are down, and also comboing out might get complicated in following turns because of the displacer on Stevens' side of the battlefield. So going for it right now, and I do not believe Stevens can beat this combo. So he can in a really weird way, which is, and this is asking a lot, as you see he's going to concede the game, but uh, he can go to displacer plus thought not seer. And try to deck. And try to deck. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, yeah, not going to try to do that right now, which I agree with. That's asking a lot, especially when Tenjum has the, the kill kind of set up next turn with Murderous Redcap. Yeah. All the scrying and the protection from Spellskite. So not going to see that happen as Andrew Tenjum is going to win game number one here over Todd Stevens. Obs on company very quickly up a game over the Bant Eldrazi deck that Todd Stevens has brought to Indianapolis. So we turn our attention to the sideboards here for both players. And we will start with Stevens and his four Graph Diggers cage. Three timely reinforcements, two negate, two stony silence, two engineer explosives, one threat, Tuscan, one world breaker. Uh, there's a really obvious one 
one here, I think. Four copies of Grabtaker's Cage and probably the two copies of Negate. I would imagine that's what Stevens wants for the matchup. Um, I, I think that he can get a pretty big advantage on the battlefield as long as he's not being comboed out or getting buried by Collected Company. And Grabtaker's Cage and Negate help fight that kind of fight. For Tenjim, he's got four Thoughtseize, three Path Exile, two Abrupt Decay, two Scavenging Ooze, two Sin Collector, Kasali Pride Mage, and Lors off Pontiff. I would guess this is a Path to Exile Abrupt Decay style matchup. Just a little interaction for uh, Todd's mid range threats. Probably not enough individually powerful cards or synergistic pieces for Thoughtseize, and the rest of these cards are for other matchups. So probably just the pass and the decays. Well, we'll see exactly how these players do on a sideboard here for game number two in just a moment. Tom Stevens will be on the play. And as we are watching Modern here this weekend, you can be playing Modern next weekend in Modern Weekend. Grand Prix Los Angeles hosted by Channel Fireball is one option, and Grand Prix Charlotte hosted by Star City Games is another. And you can find out more about the latter right now. On May 20th through the 22nd, make plans to be part of Modern Weekend and Magic the Gathering history when StarCityGames.com proudly presents Grand Prix Charlotte. Register for the Modern Format main event to compete for thousands of dollars in prizes and receive an exclusive playmat featuring Jace as he pours over the pages of Tomio's journal. Select the three-day Infinite Challenge package to compete in all challenge events for one low price, while also walking away with the exclusive Jace playmat. Add a premium rewards package and take home a collectible pin, deck box, 80 count pack of sleeves, and playmat, all featuring the iconic Noble Hierarch. Play and select side events for even more chances to win additional Noble Hierarch pins, deck boxes, sleeves, and playmats all weekend long. And don't forget to come say hello to Grand Prix Charlotte's many special guests, including cosplayer Christine Sprinkle and an artist alley full of fan favorites, headlined by guest of honor Rob Alexander. Be part of Modern Weekend and Magic the Gathering history. Register for Grand Prix Charlotte today. Modern Weekend is somehow next weekend. Grand Prix Los Angeles, Grand Prix Charlotte, two options, same format. Pick and choose where you want to go and have some fun playing Magic next weekend. And perhaps we'll see Andrew Tenjim at one of those, a player who is really making a name for himself recently. A member of Team Lotus is a 23-year-old from Madison, Wisconsin, with 11 open top eights. I remember the win in Cincinnati a couple of years ago and an invitational top eight as well. Headed to the Players' Championship this year. He was born in South Korea, won over $20,000 playing daily fantasy football. Collect your cash! Set your lineups, <laughs> collect your, your cash, cash every it's, time. It's literally that easy. You can do it right now. Promo code, no yeah. chance of winning. Why is that an impressive stat? Doesn't everyone just win $20,000? Yeah. Like, they give you that when you sign up on the website. In theory, everyone in the room right now in Indianapolis can right. sign up and collect that much cash. Yeah. Andrew Tenjim is the least winning daily fantasy sports <laughs> player in the room at only $20,000. And the self-proclaimed <laughs> number one Taylor Swift fan in the world is Andrew Tenjim, someone that we love to watch play OBS on company. For Todd Stevens, a brewer from the Texas area. A lot of fun to watch. And one of the players I've actually got to know a lot better over the course of this year. We saw him kind of at the back end of last year. I remember him kind of introducing himself to us in the booth. And he said, I'm, I'm going to be playing a lot, making a run. And he's 30 years old from Denton, Texas. Three open top eights for the high school math teacher. Played Division One college tennis at Robert Morris University, who actually does eSports scholarships now, which is really cool. And refuses to wear a hoodie or a pair of sweatpants, which I did not know, which means I respect him a little less now. Yeah, he can't hang out with us. Yeah, just, You can't sit with us. I'm not sure... <laughs> why that's where you draw the line but i can't really stop them so why do you draw why do you draw the line anti sweatpants they're I mean, great i think just todd cares a lot about carrying himself a certain way that's fine and sweatpants are just they're it, he seems like more of a suit pants kind of guy than a jean shorts kind of guy okay. and so, on, on the on you know on the spectrum Sweatpants are a lot closer to jean shorts than they are to suit pants. Oh, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. He does love a good tie, though. I'll give him that. And his tie his tie game is on point. Yes. Every weekend, his tie game is on point. You see Tenjim going to take a mulligan. It looks like Stevens is going to keep. So I, I can give him that. His tie game is certainly on point. While Andrew does take a mulligan very quickly here, we do want to talk about the Star City Games YouTube page. It is where you can go back and watch the replays of this match. And as you will find out here in just a moment, a whole bunch more. Yeah, a lot of content up on the page. Again, youtube.com slash Star City Games. Become a subscriber for free. A lot of archives there. The Versus Series, Premium Archives, SCG Tour Archives, 
and content that's exclusive to the YouTube page, such as unboxings. Again, youtube.com slash Star City Games. Become a subscriber for free today and get notified when new content is uploaded to the page. We've almost got 100,000 subscribers over there, so be one. Let us crack that number. It would be pretty awesome to be able to do that. Looks like Tenjim going to take a look at another opening hand here, see if he's happy with six cards, is number three on our Player of the Year race here on the SCG Tour. And I think of players that we've actually just got to watch grow and get better at Magic, someone like Ross Merriam, who we've watched grow over the past couple of years. I think Andrew Tentrum falls in that camp as well as someone whose game has just gotten better and better over the years. And Stevens, I think, is also on a similar trajectory. He's new to all of this, but I know that he has some pretty ambitious goals. He's playing a lot. He's starting to have more and more success. You see Graf Digger's cage to start. Birds of Paradise there for Tentrum off the basic forest be a big feather in Stevens' cap to get to the Players' Championship this year. Absolutely. As there is a Tarmogoyf. Now, that's one of the cards that's kind of unorthodox in his deck. We'll see how good it does perform. We'll see, excuse me, how well it performs in this particular game. But we'll also, while Tentum takes his second turn, take a look at Graf Digger's Cage and see exactly how powerful that card is in this matchup. It's just a one-mana artifact, but it's really tough for Obs on Company to beat. Well, it, it really shuts down the hallmark cards of the deck in Collected Company and Court of Calling, breaks up some of the synergies as well. A little surprised to see Tarmac Life here from Stevens. I would have guessed that th if I was in this spot, that would be the first card I would sideboard out in this matchup. Yeah. I think just brawling with random numbers on the ground is, is not a, the type of game that he can play in this matchup. On top of that, his, de his deck does not fill up the graveyard very fast. Neither does Tenjum's. So the Goyf is not going to naturally get very big. Kosai Pride Mage here from Tenjum means that he does have an answer to the cage. And that's actually one of the nice things about Obzon Company that we've seen from this type of deck birthing pod decks, all that stuff is, they've just got incidental ways to kill artifacts. So Graf Rigger's Cage is not game over by any stretch. Yeah, you have some creatures you can go find. Also, a couple copies of Abrupt Decay in the sideboard. Stevens has some creatures in, in his deck that are three mana or less, and uh, if those don't show up, well, it's also an answer to Graf Rigger's Cage. Stevens does have a basic forest in hand. We'll see how he wants to move forward here. can cast the path if he wants to, but he's going to start off with an Ancient Stirring. So... Take a look at the top five, see if you find something that he does like there. And Breeding Pool among the options. Reality Smasher as well. But we have not seen the explosion here from Stevens from the, his Eldrazi deck because we have not seen Eldrazi Temple just yet. Path to Exile is a tough way to do it in this matchup because there's all these innocuous creatures. There's not one that you can just get out of there and, and break up everything that Tenshin's doing. On top of that, Tenshin has plenty to do with extra mana, so pathing him and allowing him to find lands is a big cost. Another Tarmogoyf there for Stevens. The Tarmogoyfs are one twos right now, so we head back to Tenjim. be his third turn of the game. For Andrew, he does have the Kwasali Pride Mage, which can take care of the cage. Birds of Paradise, a Noble Hierarch, a couple of lands over there as well in the battlefield in Forest and Horizon Canopy. Third land is a Windswept Heath. And it looks like Pride Mage might be ready to rumble in the jungle. Keep in mind, 4-4 four, four because of two Exalted Triggers, one from the Pride Mage itself and one from that Noble Hierarch. Steven's no good blocks available, so he'll fall down to 14. And Tension will simply pass the turn back. Over to Todd we go. Drowner of Hope is the draw. But he is a long way away from that powerful spell. Cavern of Souls is the play. Find that naming Eldrazi. Now here is Thought Not Seer. I have a feeling Tenjim may have a response. Yeah, with five mana available, if he wants to, he can blow up the Graf Digger's Cage and cast Collective Company. I, I suppose he can do a similar line of play with Court of Calling as well. Tenjim will respond first by sacrificing a Windswept Heat, so he'll lose at least one life, potentially more. Tarmogoyfs do turn into two threes now that there's a land in the graveyard. Basic planes here from Andrew. That, that's the nice part about this whole thing for Stevens, at least. Assuming the line is sacrifice, pride, mage, get the graphic's cage off the table, cast collected company, creature goes to the graveyard for the Tarmic Wave, an artifact goes to the graveyard, now an instance going to the graveyard. Quarter calling, same deal here. Mm -hmm. So at least the Tarmic Waves are now applying some real pressure. Yeah, Tarmic Waves doesn't look so bad now. Here's Viscerous Seer. Uh-oh. <laughs> I might be a little scared. But that also might mean that Tenjim's hand is just nothing, and it sure. looks like it is just two lands. So he wants to work his way towards the combo, and what's interesting about this, right, is that if he draws Collect a Company next turn, he could just Collect a Company into the Blackjack and just have infinite life all of a sudden. And in the meantime, he's got a lot of chump blocking and a lot of scrying, too, so he's got some time to find it. Now those Tarmogoyfs, as you mentioned, they're 5-6s now. 
They were irrelevant a turn ago, now they're much larger. And all of a sudden, Tenchum has to worry about his life total because he's being attacked for 10. So this is very real stuff as this game has changed quite a bit thanks to that Thought Knots here. Yeah, it's, it's possible here that, that Tenjim's line of play could have been and maybe should have been just let the Thought Knots here resolve. Because he's under a lot more pressure now having put all these different car types in the graveyard than he would have been if he just let it resolve. Then he's just playing against a 4-4 Thought Knots here and the Tarmac Waves are still, uh, I believe, 1-2s. What's Tenjim got now? Just Collected Company off the top of the deck. Well, if you know that you're going to draw a Collected Company, <laughs> then I really, then I definitely like Tenjim's line of play here. Well, there's a Kitchen Finx, Path to Exile. What's that last one? It's just a land. So here is Finx. Tenjim will gain some life. But if Stevens is out of disruption here, uh, again, this is he's going to gain some life here. He's got a lot of chump blocking. The Viscerous here lets him scry a, a bunch. He's got cop at least one copy of Horizon Canopy and maybe another one left over in his hand. Uh, he's got a lot of time to set this up if Stevens' hand is just lands and some random creatures. Oh, he's got a real spell there in Reality Smasher. This is going to allow him to attack with all of his creatures. Tension will have to do the necessary chump blocking to stay alive this turn. We'll see how much it's going to have to be, however. Well, he's got a, you know, the, the Tarmogoyf and the Reality Smasher are lethal together, so he's got to block three creatures here. Mm -hmm. That means he yeah. might just lose his Ste board. Stevens has got a four and three fives, no. and Tension's at nine, so he has to block off. So Reality Smasher, very timely. Yeah. He needed a threat that was large and had haste. He found that in one card in Reality Smasher, and now Tenshim is forced to do some blocking, which he doesn't really want to do because now the House of Cards kind of crumbles. Yep. And uh, there's another um, small consequence here uh, of tapping the bird instead of the Horizon Canopy. With one more Chump Blocker, he can keep the Viscerous Seer a little bit more easy and get a lot of looks at it. Sure. Now if he has to commit his Viscerous Seer to a block, it's a lot harder for him to combo out. Finx is going to be sacrificed to Viscerous here, which means that Tenjum will gain a little bit of life and he'll also get a Scry Trigger. That top card is going to become the bottom card as he goes up to 11. Now it's damage will resolve. Sacrifice this here to get to Scry again. Top yeah. card becomes the bottom card again. It's possible that Tenjum has worked himself into a spot now where there's no single draw that does it. He has to shoot the moon with Collected Company from here yeah. to be able to, to win. Well, he's done some scrying. He's also some sacrifice the Horizon Canopy. He'll draw a card for the turn. And that is going to do it. So Todd Stevens is going to win game number two here over Andrew Tenjum. Vance Eldrazi, Obzon Company all tied up. Get ready here for game number three. Note, again, we saw kind of the busted nut draw there from Tenjum in game one. And now, while we didn't see Stevens' best draw, we could see his best draw in game three here that involves Eldrazi Temple. Yeah, we still have not seen Temple. And uh, I, I imagine the deck operates very differently with that land. A lot of interesting lines of play there from, from Tenjum. I think that he made, you know, the, the elementary ABC lines of play there, I think that Tenjum made and they looked pretty good on the surface. In retrospect, I'm not sure uh, about the total line that he took there. I'm not sure he's supposed to try to uh, quarter calling there because it increases Stevens' clock so much. I'm not sure if he's supposed to tap the Birds of Paradise instead of the Horizon Canopy for a variety of factors. So um, the, the plays look pretty straightforward, but I, I think there's room to debate that he could have taken different lines in both spots. Well, you see the sideboards here again. We've already went over what those players are working with. We don't think much will change. Grafjigger's Cage, of course, in for Stevens. For Tenjum, perhaps you'll see some copies of Abrupt Decay. We know the Pride Mage is in the deck as well. So they'll shuffle up, get ready here for game number three, and we'll have Andrew Tenjum on the play. And while they do get ready for Game 3, we're going to talk about the Season 2 schedule here on the SCG Tour. We've already done our Columbus Invitational. That was won by Max McVitie. We saw him earlier today. We saw Milwaukee, where Andrew Tenjum made the top eight. And now we're here in Indianapolis, where we can see one of these two players make the top eight. Little bit of a break, and then the ATL, my friend. Yeah, remember, next weekend, Grand Prix Charlotte, hosted by Star City Games. Not technically part of the SCG Tour, but that event will be run by Star City Games. You can find out more information about that on our website. After that, we go to Atlanta and Orlando for Standard, then Modern in Dallas towards the end of June, the 25th and 26th, then a Worcester Open in, uh, excuse me, a Legacy Open in Worcester, then Standard in Columbus, Standard in Baltimore, our regional championships, starcitygames.com slash regionals for more information as we get closer to that event, Modern Syracuse, and then the Season 2 Invitational in New Jersey, August 19th through the 21st. Now, as we have changed things up for Season 2 a little bit here, we're giving out play mats for individual formats. So before it was if you played in our main event, you would get a play mat. Now it depends on what type of tournament you play in. So for Standard, for example, we've got a Standard Classic tomorrow morning here in Indianapolis. You'll get Sagarda as your play mat. For our 
Modern for all of our main event players here this weekend. You get Ghost Quarter and for Legacy, you get the very iconic Thalia Guardian of Thraven. So if you sign up for a open or classic during season two, whatever the format is, you get the associated play mat along with it. All you have to do is sign up, you'll get one of these play mats. So come on out, play some SCG Tour events during season two and pick up one of these awesome play mats that goes along with its format as we get ready here for game number three between Tenjum and Stevens. Steven's trying to put a deck kind of on the radar here in Bantel Drazi for Tenjum. Well, his deck is very well known and maybe the best one in the room. Um, well, it's certainly been the talk of the format over the last couple of weeks. I think it's a deck that you can try to address in a number of ways. You can try to go over the top of it because the deck is not the highest in terms of raw power. You can try to go underneath of it because it's not the fastest deck in the format. You can try to find some holes in the armor like Grafdigger's Cage, and Stevens is kind of trying to do that sort of plan here. So. There's a lot of different routes you can take to try to attack this deck. But it's still very powerful. Absolutely. I mean, it's not Birthing Pod powerful, thank God. But um, it doesn't still have the really same, good. not the same level of consistency and not the same inevitability. But a lot of the same elements are there. And a lot of the good matchups for Birthing Pod are still good matchups for Obzan Company. Yes. And one of the things I really like about this deck is just its flexibility. Mm -hmm. You know, you can decide what silver bullets you want to run for a particular weekend. One of the things that I've realized over time watching this deck is that assembling the three card combo to gain infinite life or deal infinite damage is really not as hard as it seems because of Collective Company and Court of Calling and the ability to use Eternal Witness to get that stuff back. It's just a really good, consistent, powerful deck. That's all it is. And if you've got the time to figure out the lines of play and how you should be searching for lands and all that good stuff, because there are some intricate plays to be made with this deck, but it is a heck of a deck once you have harnessed all of its power. Yeah, you have a lot of games that are on autopilot where you're just assembling the combo pretty fast via mana acceleration, uh, but you really get to see the, the skill of the pilots uh, when it's contested, when they're playing around counters or removal spells or uh, trying to play through a card like Grafdigger's Cage. We are underway here in game number three for Tenjum. He starts off with a Temple Garden for Stevens. It's a Brushland and a Grafdigger's Cage yet again. And that offends a Kentry Spirit there from Tenjum. Will be one piece to his very powerful puzzle. For Stevens, will we ever see the Eldrazi Temple? He does have an Ancient Stirring Sand that he can cast and maybe try to find it. And it looks like that's exactly what he'll do. Cavern of Souls, Matter is Shaper, Reality Smasher. Eldrazi Temple, Horizon Canopy. He's taking Matter Reshaper. That uh, that speaks volumes about what's in his hand, I yeah, think. Yeah, probably a lot of mana. Yeah. There's a Windswept Heath past that turn back. Especially because Matter Reshaper is not really a prize in this matchup. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the this deck is very good at, at blocking threats of that size. It's a Scavenging Ooze here for Tenjum. He'll get a Bolster Trigger. He'll put it on Anafenza. Here's an attack for three. Stevens will fall down to 16. Does Tenjum have land number three? The answer appears to be no, as Stevens will now fall down to 15. Sacrifice that windswept teeth. So there's a breeding pool. One of the things I think that's pretty notable is just the Bantel Drazi deck. With Todd, with the way Todd's built his deck, the mana is just pretty simple. Well, it's just going to work, I think. Cavernous Souls, Eldrazi Temple, and a variety of pain lands. Yeah. It should be reliable to cast your colored spells and your Eldrazi. Even has room for a couple of basics, one forest, one plains, one island. If uh, you know, a card like Path to Exile or Blood Moon shows up, he's actually got that covered as well. And just in the beatdown matchups, it matters a lot to be able to fetch for only one damage instead of three. Yeah. Stevens will draw a card. You see he does have an Engineer Explosives in hand. Here is a Matter of Shaper. That'll slow down the beats. This is a very good setup here for, for Stevens here. He gets Matter Reshaper this turn, and assuming nothing too bad happens, he can Explosives for two next turn. There's a Fiend Hunter. That'll take care of Matter Reshaper. You also get a Bolster Trigger. Scavenging you is a little bit larger. Here come the beatdowns again. Stevens is going to fall down to nine. And uh, I don't know exactly the nature of Tenjum's hand, but I think I like Stevens's position here if he's able to Explosives away the two two-mana creatures, and then it's Fiend Hunter versus Stevens's Leftovers. You have to assume he's in a pretty good spot then. Now, one of the things I want to do if I'm Todd is I want to blow this up right away. Yep. I don't want to worry about Court of Calling work its way, working its way into the equation. Also, you know, it's Tentum's not really going to do much more. You know, he's not going to put any more twos on the battlefield. Yeah, this is, I think this is unnecessarily fancy here to pass. You had to do this anyway because you're essentially facing lethal. And 
Tenjum can potentially respond with more flexible collected companies and court of callings now that he has additional creatures on the battlefield. Yeah, you don't really know what you're opening the door for. Now, I suppose, I suppose, court of calling isn't that big of a deal because Graf Yorker's cage on the battlefield. Sure. So, you know, maybe by Todd just passing the turn, you can actually walk Andrew into a mistake. Seems very, uh, I, you know, Tenjum has ways to blow that thing up, and I don't think Tenjum is going to make that kind of mistake. You're right that, that he doesn't have to, on the battlefield at least, worry about the, the most punishing cards for taking that line of play. It still strikes me as unnecessarily fancy if you're just going to blow it up anyway. Eternal Witness is here to get back scavenging us as we head back Todd Stevens' way. Reality smash for the draw. So it appears he's found a clock to work with. But again, we still have not seen the explosive Eldrazi Temple yet. Now, for what it's worth, Stevens did pass up on the opportunity to take that with an Ancient Stirring. So here's a Temple Garden. The follow-up is another cage. Those are not great in multiples. And Steven's life total is not particularly high right now. So we go back over to Tenjum. We know he's got a scavenging use in the grip. You see the battlefield here with Eternal Witness and Fiend Hunter coming into the red zone. Path to Exile is going to take care of the Fiend Hunter. You have to imagine this is all before blocks, of course. That means Stevens will get the opportunity, potentially, to block with a matter reshaper. And I think that uh, Stevens is probably going to take that opportunity to block and trade here. He gets a card for his troubles off the matter reshaper. And uh, you can see Stevens' hand has a reality smasher in it, and he's been on the back foot basically the whole time. So I think he would like to get in a position where he starts racing with reality smasher with the highest possible life total. Looks like he may not be given the ability to block. Yeah, there's a path to exile. Stevens will get to search up a land. Again, we mentioned the basics that he does have. One of each, an island, a forest, and a plains. Plains already on the battlefield as both players resolving path to exiles right now. Tenjum going to search up a swamp. Stevens gets himself a forest. They'll shuffle and present their decks to each other, and then play will resume. This would be a really good spot for Drowner of Hope. Don't know if it's still yep. in Stevens' deck, but... Just a lot of numbers and a lot of control over combat, and I think that's what Stevens is in the market for right now. Tenzin's going to take one. There's a Scavenging Ooze. Scavenging Ooze is a pretty good spot right now for that card. A lot of creatures have died in this game. Remember, Tenzin did get, get that back, excuse me, with the Eternal Witness. So, Stevens is on tap. We know he's got a Reality Smasher. Picked up another copy of Reality Smasher, and you said Drowner. There it is. Yep. Two Scions on the way here for Todd, and this might help him stabilize this game. 5-5 five is the biggest thing in play. Gets to do a lot of tapping with the Scions. And he can follow up with Rea Reality Smasher next turn and, and potentially flip this over into a turn uh, two-turn clock on the other side. And that's what Eldrazi was all about previously, before the bannings, before Eye of Ugin kind of got knocked out of the format. It was a deck that could stabilize and then kill you very, very quickly. Tenjum with the Viscerous here. There's a forest. That forest is important. Reason why, third green source of mana there with Temple Garden and Horizon Canopy. So we could see Scavenging News, assuming there are three creatures in graveyards, eat three creatures and turn into a 5-5. Five five. I think there's just the Anafenza. Okay. Because I believe the Ooze got brought back with the Eternal Witness. It did. And nothing else has died. Looks like Tenjum's got some interest in sacrificing the Horizon Canopy. You can see in his hand he does have a Court of Calling, but those two Graf Trigger's Cages are really messing that up. Time for Tenjum to draw. I think he may have picked up another copy of Eternal Witness. Didn't get a great look at it, unfortunately. But as you mentioned, with only one creature in the graveyard right now, it appears, Scavenging U is not that threatening, so all Tenjum can do is pass the turn back over to Steven. Steven's will draw, and I think he may have picked up Eldrazi Displacer, and now that changes the whole dynamic of this game. Uh, Displacer is really bad news here for, for Tenjum because... He's got to try to kind of muck up the game and get some trump blocks going and try to scry and uh, assemble a hand that can either overpower Stevens' board or get the Graf Dicker's cages off the table and go. And Displacer makes that very hard. Especially alongside Drowner of Hope. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's just... That's a combo we used to see. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot to play through. The question is, does he want to go towards Displacer, or does he want to go towards Reality Smash, or maybe try to get a clock going in this game? Looks like he's going to start with Displacer. He's left colorless mana available between the Brushland and those Scions to be able to activate this 
once, potentially twice a turn. And we know this thing unchecked, it steals games. It just runs away with them. It's just too powerful. I'm a little surprised to see Stevens not attack with the Drowner there. Okay. Because there's no block that Tentrum can put together that can play through an activation of the Displacer. And even if something weird happens, Stevens still has the Scions in play to, to tap stuff on the way back. Maybe a little too safe. I mean, I can, I can understand. You have two Graph Trigger's cages, and you're, a, you're working towards a very powerful position. Just play defense for one turn. But I think there might have been a spot for a pretty safe attack. Eternal Witness is here. It's going to get back Path to Exile. Now, what I'm curious about is what Path Exile is going to try to target. And if we're going to play a little bit of game of cat and mouse here between the Displacer and the Drowner. Well, uh, you know, th this is... It, it's Tendrum can always take care of the Displacer. Displacer mm -hmm. can't save itself. And because it requires... Stevens requires three mana up to activate his Displacer against one mana from Tendrum, I think Stevens can't really play the waiting game too effectively. He's probably just going to have to let something good get past. Sure. I, I think if I'm Todd in this spot, we'll see what the rest of Andrew's turn looks like. I, I think I'm just going to continue as, uh, continue business as normal, which is after my Displacer on Drowner, and then you pick what you want to path. Because my Displacer can't save itself. Yep. And I think Displacer is probably the more relevant of the threats that are on the battlefield right now. That said, no activation just yet. Here is Reality Smasher. And when will the attacking begin, assuming it does? Now, keep in mind, Steven still has the ability to activate the Displacer here mm -hmm. because he's got his land plus the two Scions that can make Hollis mana. So it looks like Smasher's coming in now. Interesting stuff here. Unclear if Tenjum has a good block or not, and how Tenjum wants to use that path to exile. For right now, he's going to use his life total as a resource, fall from 17 to 12. Ideally, Tenjum would like to have a battlefield such that he could put enough in front of the Reality Smasher to force a move from Stevens, and then the path of, to exile could come into the equation. But that block from Tenjum requires him to put, what, Viscera Seer and two Eternal Witnesses in front? And at that point, Stevens says, okay, fine, we'll trade off all this. Yeah, but by all means, I'm perfectly fine with that. Here is a path. Going to go after the Displacer. No real need for an activation there. Doesn't do anything. Yeah, it doesn't do anything except taps the brush land, basically. Yeah, and taps the Drowner. Yeah. If you activate it there. So you see him just hold steady. And Displacer can't save itself, so pretty straightforward play on both sides. And, and for what it's worth, if you think of what Tenjin was doing in Season 1, where a lot of his accomplishments came, he did it with Eldrazi. Mm -hmm. One of the people who put blue-white Eldrazi on the map, given his performance on Magic Online. So he knows about how Displacer works in situations like this. And he knows that he's got to get that off the battlefield first before he can move forward accordingly. Now, something to keep in mind here. Stevens' life total throughout all of this has been pretty low. He's at six. Mm -hmm. So he, he's sitting in a pretty good position. I think he's done a nice job of stabilizing the board, but six is not a lot of life to work with. I think that he's got a pretty big edge as long as these Graph Diggers cages stay in play. Uh, if, if it's just, if the game slows down and it's an issue of who just has the better creatures inside of combat and the creatures with better combat-related keywords, mechanics, and, and powers, Stevens is way ahead. The way that Tenjum generates his advantage is he's got quarter calling, he's got collective company, and Stevens does not interact with the combo elements of Tenjum's deck that reliably. But with that dimension shut off, Tenjum's got to win the attacking and blocking game, and Stevens' deck plays that a lot better than Tenjum's. Cavern of Souls, the draw there for Stevens to go along with the Windswept Teeth, and we know about the other Reality Smasher in his hand, so just one action card. But if the first Reality Smasher was good, you have to imagine the second one will be too. It's just how aggressive does Todd want to get? There is another Reality Smasher. And the other thing, too, you can't forget as well, is Drowner can force certain blocks here. Yep. Tap specific creatures. Cause but a real headache. I, this is, I, I think Stevens' logic is as follows. This, this attack right here is probably going to require some amount of blocking from Tenjum, and it will probably involve having to put multiple creatures in front. 
At that point, there's a bunch of creatures in Tangent's graveyard. He can then grow the Scavenging Ooze to be of a comparable size to the Reality Smashers or whatever Stevens has in play. So I think Stevens wants to offer up this attack this turn, get some damage in, force Tangent to block, and then once the Scavenging Ooze is pumped to be large enough to brawl, then you're going to see the Scions start tapping down the Ooze, and Stevens will continue to attack with his large creatures. Here's the big block. So Stevens just lets this go. You, you imagine that Tangent's going to just allow this trade to happen and put everything onto the scavenging news after the fact, and then Stevens will try to control that with the Scions from Drowner. Sure. I think, I think realistically that's all he can kind of do right now. Right. He has, to start, he has to start trying to trade off a little bit here. You know, he's getting hit for chunks of 10. His creatures aren't going anywhere, so he, this is the line he has to pl play towards, even though uh, Drowner and the Scions make it very complicated. For Tension, we'll start by sacrificing a Windswept Teeth. He's going to fall down to four. And there's a basic force. The life total will be going back up here in just a moment because of the Scavenging Ooze activations. For Scavenging Ooze, obviously it's going to remove some creatures, but also gains a little bit of life. And I think gaining life right now is uh, certainly relevant. Yeah, it's a bit of a cushion. And now Stevens is down to just one creature with Trample. So if Tension can cobble together a couple more creatures to chump block or a way to remove Reality Smasher. Maybe he can survive the Scavenging Goose getting tapped over the course of several turns, but it's going to be tough. Again, without being able to play towards Collected Company or Court of Calling right now, um, Tenjim has to fight this game fair, and his deck just doesn't play that game as well as Stevens' does. Tenjim with two, and I think we're going to make it three Scavenging Goose activations, so that's why the die is on three on the Ooze right now. It is turned into a 5-5. Five five. It's also gained Tenjim three life, so he's back up to seven. He's untapping. He'll be drawing here in just a moment. Did get a great look at the draw step. But he does have some big draws available, mostly white cards, honestly. Path Exile, Fiend Hunter, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But he also has some real bad draws available in his deck and collect a company in Court of Calling. So some real highs and some real lows here for Andrew. On the other side, if Tensham can get the Drowner of Hope off of the battlefield and get his Scavenging Goose to a 6-6, he's got the game stabilized for yeah. now. A lot can go wrong, Displacer, Path to Exile, another Drowner, and so forth, but uh, he would at least stabilize that way. The problem is that Drowner right now is going to be tapping down that Ooze, and uh, I think Tenjim has a lot of eggs in that basket. Ooze will attack, and a token will block. A little surprised to not see the token be sacrificed to tap down the Viscerous here. Yep. Here's a Kitchen Face. Yeah, that seems like a, a tap that Stevens has to make there because he's got a, a five-power non-trampling creature in play. Mm -hmm. So every random chump blocker matters a lot. Another Drowner, the draw there for Stevens. That's going to be a lot. Uh, that actually just might be game right here. No, I'm sorry. Tenjim can sacrifice. Well, if, if Todd gets a little too far ahead of himself, he gets himself in trouble. Yeah, I think, I think he might be getting too far ahead of himself here because he's going to attack here with all of these creatures. But Seer, well, actually, no, Cage. Oh, OK, yep. yeah, he's Cage still safe. doesn't come back. Yep, he's safe. Ooze can gain two, which is up to 11, but this is an attack for 11. And so either yep. Witness. Tenjim needs to have a blocker or pick up three life or some mixture there. Just gaining yep. two is not enough. Gain another life up to 11. And then it looks like it's going to be 11 points of damage exactly. So Drowner is actually game over, and that is going to do it. So Todd Stevens is going to win this match here over Andrew Tenjum. Two games to one. Bantel Drazi will take care of Obs on company. And what's notable about this is you didn't see a busted Eldrazi draw. You saw some normalized gameplay, at least as normal as it can be with Eldrazi, but it was good enough to get the job done. Yeah, no turn two matter reshapers or turn two or turn three thought not seers. Um, but you can see... Once Stevens has access to four copies of Graf Digger's Cage, the matchup is very different. 